I'm just missing one piece of the jigsaw, he said, and that's you. He said, if I get a centre forward of your calibre, he said, we'll win the league. You're, you're a nice guy and you're, you're pleasant and you're this and you're that. He said, but I look at you in the football field, he said, it's just a different animal, a different beast. And I said, yeah, it is. I said, because it's called crossing the white line. So they said, what do you mean? I said, when I cross that white line to get on that football field, don't stand in my way. What have you got to tell me about centre-halves? And I said, it's very simple. Whatever the centre-half is, I ain't. That's how you score goals. And of course, that's when Ron made the famous, to Tony Gubbin made the famous statement, do you want to bet against us? How did you respond to that, to that statement from him? I know I responded to it. I responded to saying, that's what I would have said. <laughs> Whatever you do, don't bet against us because we'll come bouncing straight back and we'll bite you. Once he's got free, I knew, and I'm looking at Argentina, and an Argentina, as I've gone forward, has gone to the near post. I know where the goalkeeper's got to cover, he's got to cover to, to the near post. So once the ball is past Argentina and it's past the centre half, I'm now in the middle of the goal. A thousand things are going through my head, but the most important thing that's going through my head, all the practice you've done of these opportunities, make good contact with the ball. You are listening to Claret and Blue, an Aston Villa podcast brought to you by Birmingham Live. Hello and welcome to a special edition of Claret and Blue podcast. I'm Matt Kendrick and I'm delighted, honoured and privileged to be joined by probably the most famous shin in Aston Villa's history, Mr. Mr. Peter With. How are you, Peter? I'm good, Matt. Thank you very much. That shin <laughs> has changed to a right foot volley from 35 yards when I do my uh, happy birthdays to people. <laughs> Doesn't matter how it went in, it went in. That's the main thing. You're joining us from, from sunny Australia, aren't you, today? Yes. <clears throat> Unfortunately, due to what's happened in the world, um, it's just one of them things, really. We were in lockdown and really it's only just come out of lockdown. So um, we're just in, a, in the process now of trying to get uh, back to the UK um, for numerous reasons, really. Family, uh, my mother, um, I haven't seen her for a couple of years and she hasn't been too well. So it's an opportunity really to get back to the UK in, in May. And are you finding plenty of golf courses to keep you occupied in the meantime? Well, the beauty about my, my back garden is the golf course. All right. And I don't have to cut the lawn. So <laughs> I just walk out and play golf. Uh, it just so happens that um, this year I'm vice captain of the golf course. I uh, had a hole in one here. So that was my second one. I've had one in the UK and one in... Uh, one in Australia, so I'm going for my third, which will be in the Middle East, hopefully. Oh, right, lovely! Holding ones in every continent is that the uh, is that the is that the uh, the aim eventually? Yes, so it's to match. So it's just to put it on my trophy cabinet that's a European Cup, holding one. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's kick off. I mean, this is this is an Aston Villa podcast, and I know you, you you've had a, a kind of wide and varied varied career, but want to want to pin you down purely to your your, your time at Villa. Yeah. When, when you arrived at, at Villa, Peter, what what was the first inkling that you got that, that Villa wanted to sign you, and, and what convinced you that, that the time was right to, to to join this wonderful club? I was playing at Newcastle, and I left Nottingham Forest when we just won the championship, and we'd. Um, and we were going for the European Cup and I left because of a dispute with Mr. Clough uh, and joined Newcastle. And I said to the manager at the time, who was my old manager, Bill McGarry, I said to him, look, I'll join you, but I'll give it two years because I want to win things. So I want to help you get promotion into the first division and then go on from there. <clears throat> but if it doesn't happen in two years... Um, I want to. I want to leave because I want to win things. I've won things before, and I want to win things again. Um, and the beauty about it was, is that was the, one of the first years that it was you would you become a free agent. Well, you're not a free agent, but you could leave the club if your contract was up, as long as another club agreed a fee. And there was a host of clubs who were interested that I spoke to. And of course, one of the clubs that I spoke to was uh, my old boyhood team, Everton. 
Um, so my father automatically thought that I was going to join Everton and everyone in my family thought that I was going to sign for Everton. But I'd had this dream many years ago that I was playing for Aston Villa. Um, and the manager at the time was um, Vic Crow. And of course, when he signed me to go and play for the Portland Timbers, I actually thought that broke my dream, really, because it wasn't Aston Villa that I was joining. It was Vic Crow. So that was the break of the of the dream, as it were. I found out from uh, Bill McGarry that Ron Saunders was interested in signing me and I'd agreed a fee with the club. Um, and would I go and talk to them? And I, at the time, was talking to whoever was interested in signing me. But they had to convince me, really, that they were what my ambition was, as I said, to leave Newcastle was to go and win things. So I wasn't going to join a club um, that I didn't think was going to win things because that was defeating the object. I might as well have stayed at Newcastle. Um, so I spoke to, you know, I spoke to Leeds, um, I spoke to uh, a couple of other clubs. Uh, I spoke to Everton, of course, and that was the big one, really, that I went to speak to Gordon Lee, God rest his soul. You look at conversations that you have with people, and, and I had a conversation with Gordon Lee, and unfortunately, he was selling all the... Everton was selling all the best players. You know, he was saying, well, I said, who are you signing? So he said, well, we're signing you, and we've got a couple of others in the fire, and we want to do this and want to do that, and it was not convincing at all. And then I, went, I drove down to Birmingham, and I met Ron Saunders in the Metropole in the uh, NEC. When I went in to speak to him in the hotel room, um, he just said to me, he said, I've got a decent team here. So I said to him, well, I know, because I've, I've gone back in my records and followed your, you know, how you ended up starting the season, how you ended up finishing the season. Um, and I said, you have got a decent team. And he said, I'm just missing one piece of the jigsaw, he said, and that's you. So I said, um, well, thanks, that's very flattering. He said, I need a centre forward. He said, if I get a centre forward of your calibre, he said, we'll win the league. So, you know, after, I would say, 30 minutes, I thought to myself, he knows where he's going. He's got it all spot on. And I knew about the, I knew about the players. Um, he then said to me, he said, you're going to play a front with uh, another little fella who's a bit of a, a pain at times, but Brian Little will get goals. You'll put, supply goals and he'll supply goals for you because you'll be a great combination. Um, and of course, unfortunately, <clears throat> I signed for the I signed for the club. Um, and Brian, unfortunately, uh, through knee injury and a back injury, uh, he didn't play a game with me. The only game he actually played with me was his testimonial game, and that was against England. Uh, and then, of course, Gary Shaw was thrust into the limelight, um, and we hit it off straight away. It was just that um, I was what. what what we would call, when I, I'd done this at a number of clubs, I was his minder. Um, I looked after him because he was only a young player coming into the side. Um, and my job was to make sure that no big centre-halves uh, tried to overpower him. And, of course, it worked well because the both of us scored goals. I supplied goals for, for him. I was what was... And people ask me this question, what is a target man? Um, and I explained to them, I said to them, my role is to be available for every single player on the football field. So if it's the goalkeeper, Jimmy Rimmer, or it's Kenny Swain as a fullback, Gary Williams or the centre-half, the first thing that they can see is me. And so they can hit me and then everyone links up with me. So uh, that was the role of the target man. And that's why I thought to myself... I looked at the goalkeeper, I looked at the two centre-halves, I looked at the full-backs and I looked at the midfield and I thought, you know, there's, there's players in the midfield who will score goals. Um, there's a wide player in Tony Morley who's going to supply ammunition for me. Uh, there's another wide player who's up and down the field uh, and a fitness guy in, in Des Bremner. Um, and we've got a captain called Dennis Mortimer who I knew could attack from the midfield and wanted to get forward and score goals. I had this um, ability that I was never, I was never channel vision. 
I always had vision. I could see things. I might be looking one way, but I could see things happening on my right side and on my left side. I was just one of them players um, that could see things around me. And certainly Dennis Morton making bursting runs from midfield. I could see them sort of things and, and could supply the pass that basically released him to go on and score goals. So we would, you know, when I looked at the team and thought to myself, you know what, even, even if people are coming in from the reserves or maybe not in the first team, we've got a decent squad here that we can rotate around. And, of course, as you know, that we didn't use that many players in that year. But the ones that came in did a job uh, in the positions. So it was, a, it was a challenge, and it was a challenge that I relished, and that's one of the reasons why I joined. And, of course, I joined teams which were, you know, I didn't do it because of this, but they were famous for number nines. Newcastle United, famous for number nines. Nottingham Forest wasn't until I joined them, famous for number nines. So it was just a thing with regards to this target, man. Um, and as I say, Ron Son has convinced me that we were going places. What was life away from the field like for, for a footballer at Aston Villa back then? So kind of house did you have? What kind of car did you drive? Where did you go on an evening? You know, I was I was um, living in Newcastle. I'd, I, we'd renovated a house in Newcastle when we came down to Villa. I joined in May. Uh, I signed in May, and so it wasn't too long before the season. But what we wanted to do, um, we wanted to make sure that we were we were settled and the, and the, you know the boys were settled in in a house somewhere. So we frantically looked around everywhere to find you know a house which we eventually found in no the club sort of we we got a, a club vehicle so that wasn't a problem with regards to getting a vehicle we sort of quickly settled i wanted to, i really wanted to settle into a house um before the season started before pre-season started so we'd looked around and we'd looked in a lot of villages um when i was uh, playing for birmingham i couldn't afford a house over in you know solly hull or any of them areas um, it was just out of my reach. But when we joined Aston Villa, we looked around and everyone was saying to me, oh, you look at Sutton Coalfield and places like this. But I'd already known areas that I, I, I knew about. And I thought, you know what? I don't really want to live over that side. I've got friends who, of mine who live over the other side. So we'd look around Solio, Knoll, Dodditch, you know, places like that to go and find somewhere to live. And we found a nice place that we we sort of enjoyed which was in the village of no and the schools were good for the boys so we made a decision that we could we'd move there as quickly as we possibly can could and um and that's and that's what settled you into you know your life is that once you've sort of got your family settled down then you can sort of concentrate on your football you've spoken about the quality in the dressing room and you know I think when when Ron said you're the final piece of the jigsaw as flattering as that was he meant it and you could see from the team around you that, that you effectively were it but what were the personalities like Peter I should imagine there's quite quite a mixture wasn't there well yeah I mean there was funny enough there's a lot of scousers in the team so if you looked at you looked at the team you looked at Kenny Swain you looked at Ron Saunders Ron Saunders was born in the Whittle so he looked at Ron Saunders, Kenny Swain, Dennis Mortimer, Ken McNaught, who'd had a time because played for Everton and lived, although he's Scottish, he lived in in Liverpool, Tony Morley, Jimmy Rimmer, you know, and myself. So there was a lot of um, that Liverpool or Merseyside banter that was in the dressing room. But there was other things, you know, there's a lot of other things. So you had younger up-and-coming players in the, in the likes of uh, Gordon Cowans, although... Played many games, but still was a relative youngster. So Gary Shaw coming into the team, um, Gary Williams, Colin Gibson, and of course, uh, God rest his soul, Eamon DC, who stood in whenever he had to stand in to play in any position that he played in. Um, so we had a we had a, a good deck dressing room, and we had a people who were fighting to get into that dressing room because they wanted to be part of it. Um, so we had a good uh, reserve team and we had good players who were, as I say, fighting to get into the team. But you had to play really to the top level to get into the team. 
and the likes of the ones who stepped in, uh, meaning with Eamon DC, with Colin Gibson, with uh, David Geddes, who stepped into the forefront whenever myself or Gary was injured, Dave stepped in. And the same with uh, Colin Gibson, whether it was left back or right back. So Ron sort of moved the, the squad around to play in different positions. Like Des Bremner played centre half at times, uh, if any of the centre halves got injured. But, you know, you didn't want to go out of the team. You didn't want to get injured and go out of the team because the team was, you know, going through a, a patch where we were winning games. And when we had a setback, it was, you know, Ron sort of put it to the back and said, well, you know, you've had a bit of a uh, taste of, don't get too cocky, keep your feet on the ground and make sure that your next game you bounce back. And that's exactly what we did at times. We lost games and then we bounced back straight away and, and went on to on a run um, and walk, to win games, basically. How was Ron with you? Were you one of the ones who he didn't really need to put in his place because you were already a kind of a, an experienced professional and, and you knew what was expected? Or did he have to have words occasionally? Or He had little... Um, Idiosyncrasies, as you put, Carly. I did. I didn't like it, Tom, because uh, he had a thing about going around the dressing room before kickoff, and he'd walk around and speak individually to players. So he'd chat to all the players and tell them, you know, uh, what he wanted from them and how they should go about the game. I didn't like that because I, I, I was sort of setting my ways, my, my, my preparation. I prepared myself and got my mind on what I had to do. And it's I, I, I had to say to him one day, Gaffer, you know what? I don't like, you know, you coming around and, and saying, you know, talking. I said, because I'm focused on what I want to do. I said, if you're going to do it, you know, to me, do it on a Friday. You know, speak to me on a Friday. And he was fine. He never sort of, he said, yeah, he said, that's fine. And in the end, it was sometimes it was just a question of him coming around and just nodding his head, and that was enough for me. Different players have different ways to prepare themselves for matches, uh, and I had my way that I prepared for my ma matches. I always remember Gordon Cowan saying to me one day, he's sort of walking in the tunnel, and he looked at me and he said to me, he said, I've never seen anyone with the eyes like you. He said, you've just got them eyes. He said, you're focused on Nothing interferes with you, nothing from outside. He says, you just focus. He said, I'm talking to you. And he said, I don't think you're listening to me. So I just nodded my head at the time, you know. And people say to me, saying, you know what? You're, you're a nice guy and you're, you're pleasant and you're this and you're that. And he said, but I look at you in the football field. He said, it's just a different animal, a different beast. And I says, yeah, it is. I said, because it's called crossing the white line. So they said, what do you mean? I said, when I cross that white line to get on that football field, don't stand in my way because I score goals and I, I want to be successful. And, you know, if I have to go through you to score a goal, I'll go through you to score it. And it don't matter if you're my best friend, I'll have a pint beer afterwards, but not on the football field. It was always in my nature. You know, my wife used to say to me about with the kids, oh, let them win. It was like, no. No, <laughs> if they want to win, they've got to win. I'm not letting them win. We don't care if it's tiddlywinks, you know, game of chess, whatever it is. You no, know, you have to fight for everything that you get. And it's just the way that the nature that I, I was brought up in. Do you think you were born like that? I mean, were, were your own parents kind of very competitive with the way they raised you? Or? Um, my father was a an ex-footballer, a semi-professional footballer. It, it, it's always been a competitive nature of mine. I've always been competitive. Whatever I've done from school, when I was a school child, whatever I did, I tried to be number one. Um, and it's always been with me. It's the same with running. You know, when I joined Aston Villa um, and we went pre-season, everyone was telling me, oh, runs, you know, we'll be running all day, we'll be running up and down hills, we'll be doing this, doing that. And I was like, bring it on. I remember... Dave Geddes said to me once, he said, I can't believe, he said, you're six foot two and how how you can run. You just run and there's, you know, you just, as if it's effortless. I said, it's not effortless, but I run to try and win everything that I do. Um, I remember when I was at Wolves, that was when I come back from South Africa and I came back and 
you know, the manager, Bill McGarry, at the time, if you didn't get in the team on a Wednesday or a Tuesday, you went running up, up to a place called Brockton, Canic Chase, and you run up hills. And I always remember when I first came back from South Africa, and you used to do all the running, and then when you finished, you had to wait till everyone finished and get on the coach. And I thought, you know what? I think I'll just go and have a bit of a run. The coach can ca catch me up. And I always remember that Ibby was running with me and he said to me, do you not feel any of this? He said, you just seem to be running and it's fun. I said, when you worked on in Liverpool in the docks for five years um, and you do this and you're out in the fresh air and you're running, it's just, I just take in everything as I'm running along. And then it become it become a thing where it was how far that I could run down that road before that coach could catch me. Bill McGarry was talking to the driver and he was saying to him, we must have missed him somewhere. He can't have got this far. Surely he can't have got this far. I always remember a player, we are, we signed a young lad called Tony Obi. Tony Obi was a little um, a little lad. He was probably about five foot six, five foot seven, very slightly built. And we'd done this run around Bodymore Heath. Um, and he beat me. And the lad said, oh, you've been beaten then, you know, Tony Obi. I said, yeah. But I've got a sneaky feeling we're going to have to do this again. And, of course, Ron came out and said, uh, one more lap around the thing. And, of course, uh, he didn't beat me the second time back. So in terms, of, in terms of your preparations for matches, either on the day of the match or throughout the week, was there anything special you did? I mean, what, what, what would your diet have been like and things like that? And did you have any superstitions? I used to eat for England, Ireland, Scotland and Wales. So I could eat anything. It didn't matter to me. I could eat anything. Um, and because of, you know, the amount of running that I did and the training that I did, I never really put on any weight. Um, my playing days was always about 13 stone two. Um, so I didn't, there wasn't like a preparation of saying, to, well, I'm going to eat that and that and that. Um, I didn't prepare like that. I just asked what, you know, what I felt I was eating or what Kathy had prepared for me. We didn't really go out our way and just say, we're going to do this, 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 and this. Um, <clears throat> there was no preparation food-wise. Um, Sleep-wise, didn't go out and just prepared, made sure you, everything was right, um, played the game, and then, you know, went for a meal uh, with some of the, the wives um, and girlfriends, and then had the weekend off, and then prepared again when you went in on Monday. So it was no, you know, there was no really preparation of saying we will do this, 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 and this. Um, Kathy will tell you, of course, that on a Saturday morning, she made sure the boys was not allowed in the bedroom until I was ready to get up. So I had to lie in. I always had to lie in on, on Saturdays. And Kathy had come up with my breakfast. That was probably the only preparation with regards to. And then, of course, once she brought the breakfast up, the boys were allowed to jump all over me. There was no sort of set preparation of preparing for games. It's, it was just the way that it is. A funny story that I can tell you is I had a friend of mine um, who was a Villa supporter. I met him through Kathy, and we were going to the game, and I was driving, and I was going the back way. I thought, I'll go the back way. Didn't realise what... We were sort of, I don't know, about three miles from Villa Park and we had run out of petrol. Ron Saunders was a stickler that you had to be in the dressing room before two o'clock. So I'm now looking and thinking, we've got to get petrol. So I said to my mate, you go that way and I'll go this way. And I had to run a mile, found a petrol station, got a can, got the petrol, run back a mile to get back to the car, put the petrol in the car, drive the car, arrived at Villa Park, at five to two so it wasn't late and then my mate went in the stands to watch the game uh, i went out and played and scored two goals can't remember the game exactly but i remember scored and then he said to me i can't believe you've run two miles before you've started the game and still run around for 90 minutes <laughs> i says well nature to the beast tell us about the um tell us about the the story the the, the famous wristbands then and how, how that came about well, funnily enough, wristbands, I sort of always, because sort of sweating and, and 
um, and I, I wouldn't wear long sleeve shirts. So people used to wear long sleeve shirts and wipe the brow with the shirts and that. But I never, I wouldn't wear long sleeve shirts. I always wore short sleeves. Really, I think it started at Nottingham Forest. Then went, but didn't really get them week in week out. And then went to Newcastle and, and wore them at Newcastle. But again, didn't week in week out because he'd forget them or whatever it was. So when I went to, um, when I went to Aston Villa, Jim Paul, who's the kit man who's a bit of a stickler for everything. He said, is there anything uh, you require? I said, yeah, get sweatbands. So he said, oh, I said, every game I want sweatbands. So he said, oh, okay, yeah. And sure enough, when, when he put the kit out, there was always two sets of sweatbands on my place where I got changed. And then, of course, when I started wearing them, uh, Alan Evans started wearing them, um, and other players started wearing sweatpants. But I, I sort of had this thing going back to when I was a, when I was a supporter, when I support when I sold programs at Goodison Park and went into the games. Is I had this thing in my mind um, with regards to how I see footballers on the field. Me as a supporter, as a youngster, and I, it always stuck with me, you know about autographs or being available um, and I did see a number of occasions where people wouldn't you know would a bit brush people off and I always made a thing of that saying you know what I'll never ever do that and then it started you know going to the halt end sort of waving to the crowd at the end and then thought oh well, yeah okay so then I started taking sweatpants off and throwing them into the crowd and I had a friend of mine who, who was a builder who done some building work for me in my house in Noah. And he was a big Villa fan. And he used to have set eight season tickets and sit in the Witten Lane right in the corner of the Holt end. And he started, he said to me, you know what he said after this game, he said, I don't suppose you could bring some sweatpants because I've got, you know, a niece coming. I said, yeah, yeah. So I'd go over and run over into the corner and give him the sweatpants. And then one day he gave me a bag. Of bag. So I was like, oh, Okay, thanks. And then I run sort of across the field, got in the January, opened the bag, it was sweets. So, of course, when I seen him in the week, I said, what's with the sweets? So he said, well, there's about eight of us all the time, so I buy a big bag of sweets. He said, depending on how the game goes, you know, he said, if it's a boring game, we all eat the sweets. But if it's an exciting game, like I give you, it was an exciting game and the bag was full because no one wants to eat the sweets. So that's how it. That's how that started as well. So it was. It was just a question of appreciating supporters. How much did you appreciate and kind of love that rapport that you got with the supporters? Did that kind of six foot two? Did that give, make you feel ten foot tall when when the whole ten and Villa Park was giving you that love? Yeah, because I, you know, throughout my career, as I said, what I've been talking about about remembering about um, as a supporter. It, it always stuck in my mind, you know, about what I, standing on the terrace and what I wanted from people that played, you know, like Alan Ball and people like that when they played for Everton. Uh, so it always stuck in my mind and I, I was always trying to be appreciative of, of the supporters and trying to show a little bit of um, respect back to them because, you know, they, they've worked hard all week. They've bought, you know, a season ticket or a ticket for the game. Uh, they want to be entertained, um, whether that be just throwing a sweatband to them or scoring goals or just having that connection with them. Um, unfortunately, enough in, in most of the clubs that I've played for, I've, I've tried to build that connection with, with supporters um, and never, you know, never trying to, you know, like come out of a come out after the game and people are standing there, have been standing there for an hour and want your autograph and you just walk past them. No, that doesn't, that doesn't cut, cut it for me. I think that if people have, have gone to the trouble of standing behind for an hour after the game's finished, and that's what it normally was because, you know, after you got changed and you'd done what you th did and had a few drinks with the boys, you know, so you're trying to build up that rapport and, and it, it, it works both ways. It works from them to you and you to them. And I think that that's, sadly, I think that's going out of the game to a certain degree. You mentioned um, 
the partnership with, with Gary Shaw earlier and saying that you were almost like a minder for him on the pitch. Listen, you've got to look after yourself, but did you feel the responsibility to try and help help shape Gary as well and help, you know support him and help his game? Because for the age that he was and the success that he had during those two years, it's just phenomenal, isn't it, that he was able to play at that level so soon? When I was his age, I was playing in South Africa, you know, playing part-time in South Africa. So, you know, again, re reflecting on what I wanted when I was 20, there was a few times that people that I played with, um, going back to when I played for Southport, there was a guy called Eric Redrobe who was built like a rugby player. But he, you know, at times he took me under his wing and just helped me with little, not lots of things, but little things that he give you. And, and you know, everyone sort of um, adulation, if you give people adulation they'll take that in you know keep giving me adulation keep giving me adulation but it is there comes times when you don't get that adulation because of the way you're playing or because of certain situations and you need someone at times to go and help you a little bit and I think that that me being the age that I was 29 and Gary being 29 years difference um you're trying to help him along and he's going to, you know, through games, if you think you're climbing the ladder and you're going to get up the ladder and never fall down off the ladder, you're very much mistaken. I think that, that is that is the life, not only football, that is life. You know, people say to me, how do you, what do you do? So I said, well, there's a ladder and you climb, you start climbing the ladder and you will fall down off the ladder now and again. But what you do is you grab all the ladder and you stop yourself falling and then you start climbing back up the ladder. And someone asked me the question, he says, well, how has the ladder? It goes on forever. And that's the way you've got to look at it. So my role really was trying to uh, not just help Gary, was to help anyone in the team. Uh, and, yeah, well done, well done. It was also sometimes you had to be tough life out in the, uh, out in the football field, point people in the right direction and say to them, you know, pull your finger out or... I can't say that on what I would say probably on the football field, um, but it basically would be sometimes giving people rollickings and sometimes giving them praise. Managers like uh, Ron Saunders, Brian Clough, these type of managers know when they can put their arm around and know when they have to rollick people. And you have to learn that on the football field as well. That there's times when you've got to, tell people to pull the finger out and there's times you've got to say come on don't worry about it we'll get we'll get a goal in a minute the good thing about ron is that what he wanted to do and, and you, the the successful size that i played in is that goalkeeper center half center midfield center forward spine of the team you've got people who are running their departments if you've got that through the middle of the field then you've got a chance of, of having success. And that's what we sort of did. So in my departments, you know, I looked after the people like Gary Shaw, but also Tony Morley and, um, and Dennis um, and Des Bremner looked after their departments and Ken McNaught and Al Nevins looked after their departments. So overall, the overall picture, we had people inside who knew when to G people up and when to people you know, put your arm around them. And Gary, to be fair, uh, had a wonderful opening season. And I'd like to think that it's um, it was down, not just down to me, but I think down to an understanding, a player that understands what you're going through at that age. You were prolific for kind of several seasons, not just, it wasn't just one season at Aston Villa. We'll get on to your, your most iconic goal in a minute, but what, what was your your favourite goal in terms of the one that was like the most aesthetically pleasing, the most beautiful goal that you scored, do you think? To get to where we got to and to win the championship, the last game of the season when we're playing Middlesbrough, and I've told this story and I'll tell it again, is that we trained, we always do our fr fr Friday training. Uh, we end up with a five-a-side. We end up doing sprints. Um, the one who wins goes into the dressing room and finishes and the ones who are last Get, oh, you've got to be a last for the sprints. Um, anyway, we go in the dressing room, you get changed, you go into the, um, you know, where the kitchens are, you have a spot of lunch, which 
I've been to Villa Park. I've been to, um, sorry, Body More Heath uh, lately. And it's like a five-star hotel with the food that they get. Uh, where in our day, it was like sausage and beans. We'd go into the canteen and have some food and chat. Um, and I just realised that the players were looking a bit pensive. I was like, what's wrong? So they said, you know what, we're playing middles, but it's tomorrow. So I said, and I, to be perfectly honest, didn't know the history. So I said, what do you mean? So he said, you know what, one of our bogey sides, this is our bogey side. We've lost for the last three seasons or four seasons to Middlesbrough. And I was like looking and thinking, I said, that's a bit ironic, isn't it? So they said, why is that? And I said, well, I've never been in the losing side against Middlesbrough and I always score. And they were all like, oh. And of course we played the follow, we played on the Saturday. And I just remember it could have been 10. That's how dominant we were. There was one stage, John Watson was doing a commentary and he went through a, a patch where they couldn't get out there all night. We kept winning the ball and press guys. And, um, I hit the post. Um, then I was I was involved in the goal that Gary scored. So I back, sort of played into me, Al Nevins, and then I back healed it. And then it was a half sort of shot and it would drop to Gary and Gary quick as a flash. You know, probably just outside, probably about eight yards out, bent it in the, into the top corner. So we went one nil. So that all of a sudden, everyone was like, "Wow, you know, this could happen." Then we could, you know, get the win. Um, and then it was sort of we're one nil, and it got to the second half. We got to the halt end. Um, and I always remember that I, I used to spend probably an hour before training. Um, so I dropped the, I dropped my boys off at school and then went straight to the training ground. And then I'd get changed and go out. And Brian Little was the U team coach at the time. And I'd say to Brian, can you give us a few lads? And he'd send out, you know, three or four lads and go. I'd spend an hour just doing finishing. And then it got a bit infectious then because I'd spend it. And then all of a sudden Gary had come out and then Gordon had come out and say, can I do some crossing? Then? So I'd say, yeah, go on. And then it, it just got a bit in fact, but we used to practice and practice and practice. And of course, it comes to a study um, as a striker. I study goalkeepers and I study centered off. So I knew the position and what a goalkeeper had to do to try and keep the ball at the back of the net. And I knew where centre half would be. So I, got, I used to have a thing and someone actually said to me one day, he said, what have you got? to tell me about centre-halves. And I said, it's very simple. Whatever the centre-half is, I ain't. So you went, what do you mean by that? I said, well, if the centre-half's at the near post, I've already lost him and I'm at the far post. And if he's at the far post, I'll be at the near post. So whatever he is, I'm not. That's how you score goals. And it's the same with a goalkeeper. You study about what their position and how they have to move. And for me to beat him, what I've got to do to beat him. So I used to practice for hours and hours. And Stephen, my middle son, said to me, Dad, that is, to me, one of your best goals that you've ever scored. And, of course, it stems from uh, Gordon Callan's going an amazing run in, on the left-hand side, <clears throat> playing the ball back to Tony Morley, who then gets it out his feet onto his right foot, although he's on the left, playing as a left winger, pings it to the far post and... What I said to you, practicing hours upon hours, know where, where the goalkeeper is going to be and planting my header into the far corner of the net. And if you ever watch the video, you just see him planted on what can't move, basically. And I had the ball back across and into the far corner of the net um, and then celebrate. So we're now 2 0 and we're thinking we, we have to win this game. If we win this game, we've got, we've got more than. The possibility of winning the championship, although we've st we've still got one game to go. So I look back at that goal, and that was a significant goal because it was the set. And then we Alan Emmons scored the third goal. As I said, it, I hit the post on both ends, and I had two saves by Platt, the goalkeeper, who made tremendous saves. The irony is, is that Tony McAndrew, who played centre half on the day, who come to work for Aston Villa, and I used to talk to him. And we mentioned about the game. And he said that uh, Milne, the manager at the time, had had a team meet. 
And he said to all the squad, he said, you know what? He said, if we can stop with, he said, we'll win this game. He said, so we've really got to get someone who's going to mark him and take him out of the game. And one of my mates who lived in the next village to where I lived in Liverpool, because I was from speaking, he was from Garston, was Billy Ashcroft. And Billy was a centre forward, but played centre half. So he said to the manager, I'll mark him. I'll mark him out of the game. So he said, OK. So I've now hit the post and hit the, hit the woodwork. And Tony McAndrew turns to uh, Billy and says to Billy, Billy, I've just got one thing to say to you. He said, what's that? So he said, are you ever going to get anywhere near him? <laughs> and, and Billy said to me, he said to me, he said, you never stop running. He said, how the hell do you keep up with you? He said, you just kept running and running and running and running. He said, I just couldn't keep up with you. He said, it was unbelievable. That goal sticks out in your mind because it's the last home game of the season. You have to win the game. Uh, we won the game 3-0 comfortably. And then the other thing that we had to think of afterwards, we were thinking, Middlesbrough are playing Ipswich next week. They ain't got a cat nails chance. And of course, they went on and beat Ipswich <laughs> comfortably as well. So, so in terms of that, that total winning season, at, at, at what stage did you think you got the momentum and the, and the belief that, that, that you were genuine contenders to win that title? You know, we played Everton at, at, at home and um, they beat us. And that was one of the times that Ron Saunders come in the changing room and said, you know, you might have th thought you're a bit cocky now and you thought that everything was going to be hunky-dory and this is a setback. And how do you react to a setback? Um, I know I react to a setback. This is get back on the field and win the next game. When the season started and we beat Leeds at Leeds and we sort of, we just felt conf confident and comfortable. We didn't concede many goals. I think that when we got to that stage where we were playing local derbies, um, and as you know, we probably had eight or nine local derbies that we had to play. So we take into consideration, if you look at the Midlands at the time, so you look at the, you know, the Birmingham cities, the West Bromwich Albions, the Wolverhampton Wanderers, um, the Leicester cities, the Nottingham Forest, the Notts County, the Stoke City, the Coventry City. There's eight local derbies that we had to play and we had to win them games. And everyone's trying to beat you because... At the time, you're one of the top teams and you're going for the champ. So they're trying the hardest to try and be here. If you look at Ipswich Town, they've got one local derby. They play Norwich. And it just so happens in that season, they lost and drew at them. Whereas we went through our games. And I think once we started going through them games and getting results and, and winning games, the confidence sort of grew and grew and grew. And even when, you know, when we lost to Ipswich, and there was 47,000 in the crowd. And how many in the 47,000 might, might have thought, you know what, they beat us. You know, they've got probably the momentum. And of course, that's when Ron made the famous, to Tony Gubbin made the famous statement, do you want to bet against us? And I think that that summed up when the, you know, when the lads, and that's what he said to us. It's just, it's, that is not going to win the champ. That game is not going to win the championship or lose the championship. It's measured over 42 games. You win the championship over 42 games and how many games you can win. And of course, we got we won the most games. It's as simple as that. Do you think, obviously, that's a really, really famous, iconic statement from, from Ron? Do you think that actually, you know, because it could go two ways, couldn't it? Could invite pressure on you, but did that that kind of just give you that that another gear and say, "Listen, the gaffer really believes in us. We believe in ourselves." Do you think? Did, how did you respond to that to that statement from him? I know I responded to it. I responded to saying, "That's what I would have said," <laughs> because you know it was one of them. Once they they said, "Sort of, we play a switch three times." You know, and, and we lose to Ipswich. And everyone's saying, oh, well, they're the better team. Well, you're only the better team. That's why you measured over 42 games. And once he made that statement, I thought, yeah, he's right. We know what we have to do. We had the setback when we had played Everton. Um, and we had a couple of other setbacks. And we bounced back from them. And this is the same thing. This is exactly the same thing. And, of course, what did we do? 
we bounced straight back and we went and won. So, you know, and and as I think he finally said, you know, when you win as many games as what we have, and there wasn't many teams before us, like Liverpool's and that and Forest's, that got that got that many wins as what we did. Um, and as, as I say, against teams, local derby teams. So it, it just, you know, reiterated the way we felt that whatever you do, don't bet against us because we'll come bouncing straight back and we'll bite you. Um, that, that's what happened. I know we've obviously rattled through this quite fast, but I clearly want to get you get your thoughts on, on, on 1982. Um Bit of a strange question to ask, but what's what's the the strangest place you've been stopped and recognised and, and and asked about that that winning goal? Here in Perth, Australia, we have a we have a, uh, a Lions club here. We have a Lions club in Melbourne, Houston, Texas. <laughs> I remember going to Houston, Texas? Someone stopping me in Houston, Texas. Um, there's there's lots of places that you go to. Um, Monterey. Who would have thought that you go into a bar in Monterey and someone comes up to you and says, you're Peter with we, We've got a, um, a hardware store here called Bunnings in Australia. Um, and I'm walking through Bunnings probably about two months ago. Uh, and I'm walking through with Kathy. We're holding hands and we're walking through. And then, you know, when someone walks past you and looks at you twice, gives it one of them one, and then all of a sudden shouts out at the top of his voice, it's Peter with and he comes racing back towards me and he brought, he goes just like this with his sleeve and he rolls his sleeve up and he's got a tattoo, the length of his arm, Villa Forever. And he said, I always said to all my mates that one day, one day I would be in in Bunnings and I'd bump into you and have a picture take. <laughs> um, so, this, yeah, Thailand was the same, you know, whenever I go to Thailand. But it's more so Thailand that they remember me as the coach more so than the, uh, the girl. But um, yeah, it's it's worldwide, and as I've been requested many many times, um, the amount of Lions clubs around the world is unbelievable. I went to do, funnily enough, here in Perth, I went to do a book signing, and I and as a the people who were the Lions club here asked me, um, would I go to this bar in in on the waterfront? So I'll go down this bar, which is normally packed, and I go to the guy who's, uh, who runs the bar and I said, is it all right if we go upstairs? So I went upstairs and there's two people upstairs and we had this, basically this room. So I said to them, right, we'll go upstairs, we'll do it upstairs. We'll do the, I'll do the talk, you know, Q&A, question and answers, uh, sign the books and then, you know, we'll just relax. Uh, so we're all upstairs and all of a sudden, Guy comes in the bar who's got a villa shirt on. So he comes up to the barman and he says, Can I have a pint of lager? So he says, Oh, your mates are upstairs. So you went, What mates? So he said, Well, you've got a villa shirt on, haven't you? So he said, Yeah. He said, Well, some fella called Peter Wirth is upstairs. So he's near dropped the pint. And he's like, What do you mean he's upstairs? He said, I've only flown in here to do a conference tomorrow morning. He said, I just thought I'd put my shirt on today. So he come running up the stairs and he was like, I can't believe it. I've just flown in from Brisbane and all of a sudden you're here. So I said, well, come and join the conversation and ask a few questions. Brilliant. They're everywhere. Can you, um, I know you've been asked this a million times, probably by me in the past a million times as well. Can you still picture it in your mind's eye, the moment when when Tony turns the turns the full back inside out and, and sends that ball across the, the face of goal? Probably over the last, I don't know, few months that I've been asked the question and people are reminiscing about the thing. Um, but I, I remember it being the centre of the field. And I remember me uh, fighting with Hunes, their centre half, um, and wrestling with him to keep the ball and then passing the ball on to Dennis and Dennis passing the ball on to Gary. So, you know, I can remember it back where it started on the halfway line. And then when it sort of developed and went to Gary and Gary done brilliantly to be perfectly honest when he's going to the touchline and he just checks back onto his right foot and you see Tony walking as it were and then all of a sudden when he sees that Gary's got free has made that darting run and he and 
Gary's it's a great through ball to him. And now all of a sudden he's in momentum. And this is what I say to you about wherever the centre half is, I ain't. Um, and the player that was marking me at the time is a fellow called Argan Tyler, who I've since met on, on a few occasions. Tony's got a one-on-one -on -one with the fullback and then jinx one way and jinx the other way and then gets to the, the position that he he normally gets into. He's either back on his right foot and crossing it in or he gets to the line and then he's hitting it across the box. So once it's sort of, once he's got free, I'm new and I'm looking at Argan Tyler and then Argan Tyler, as I've gone forward, has gone to the near post and can't see me. He's just focused on the ball, which I know that sent it off do that when they, they forget to look behind them. And of course, when he's hit, the goalkeeper's covering, I know where the goalkeeper's got to cover, he's got to cover to, to the near post. So once the ball is past Argan Tyler and it's past the centre half, I'm now in the middle of the goal. Um, so it's just a question of me. Um, a, a thousand things are going through my head, but the most important thing that's going through my head, all the practice you've done of these opportunities, make good contact with the ball, make sure you strike the ball. And I made, I suppose that people look back and say, it was it a flippant remark that he hit a divot? But the more you watch it, the more you see that it, it wasn't off my shin. It was, it doesn't shoot off your shin like that. It doesn't go off your shin as at the pace that it was. So as it come in, I've made contact with the ball and it's now, as we know, shot off the right angles. And I make this, it was Jimmy Greaves who asked me the question. And Jimmy said, why were you, you know, why did you play at the post? Because he was trying to be a little bit funny. So I said, well, I was trying to play one two, Jimmy, but that net stopped it coming back to me. So he, he burst into laughter, you know, he said, yeah. So um, and again, once the ball's gone into the net, my momentum is taking me, I can't go around the net. I'm in the net. So the first reaction that I have is looking into the crowd where all the supporters are and grabbing hold of the net, you know, and then by the time I come out the net, uh, Gary had got to me and then we were sort of uh, hugging and then Gordon jumped on our back and then made a comment about get down you big. I won't say what he said, but it was get down onto the floor. So he, he dragged us down onto the floor and then sort of we'd all celebrate. Um, and I, I suppose when you look upon it, you know, 67 minutes, we've now got the, you know, to the 90 minute mark. Yeah, okay, can we do it? And to be perfectly honest to you, I couldn't see us losing it. And I was still full of running. I always remember saying to the players, you know, we can kill the game off, play them into the channels and let me run them down. Um, and basically, you know, we did play balls into channels. I run them down, chased the ball, kept tried to keep possession um, and tried to create a, you know, Gordon had a, I think Gordon had a, a, a chance that um, got ruled, um, the chance got ruled out because of, offside or a, or a free kick. So it wasn't as if we were hanging on for dear life. I think we still had possession of the game um, and we were just trying to play the game. It, it wasn't a question of kept looking at your watch or looking at the stand. Or looking. I think it was just important that we just concentrated on what we were doing and the good things we were doing. And if another opportunity arose, could we take it? And I think you were you were delayed, weren't you, with the post match celebrations because you were struggling to pass water? Is that the polite way of putting it? Yeah, it was. Um, you know, we're all sort of wanting to celebrate and want to, you know, go behind the goal and celebrate with the players, and then you get that dreaded tap on the shoulder, and someone says, uh, "Mr. Witt, who number nine? You have to go and give sample Ken." McNaught got tapped on the shoulder. So the both of us are trudging through the stand, basically. So under the stand was a little caravan. And I mean a little caravan. So we end up going to the caravan and Argan Tyler and I think it's Dremner who is in the, in the caravan. So we're literally sitting opposite one another. You need to feel that much. Do they not realise that we've been running around for 90 minutes? Okay, so we're sitting there. Oh, plenty of water there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me look out the window, Ken and I. And we see this fellow walking along with a crate. So 
we said, uh, excuse me, excuse me, where are you going? So he said, oh, uh, the villa dressing room have requested the beer. Hey, give it here. Come on, where the villa? Look, see, there's a the shirt. So, of course, we get the crate in between us. We pop pop it open to have a beer. Offer, of course, being the way we are, we offer the beer to Argentile and Zemna, and they go, oh, no, 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 no. No drink, no drink, so I thought. Oh, please yourself. Anyway, we had a we had a few beers, and I was the first one who filled the, the file up. The guy come out. He said, who's, "Who's who's drinking the beer?" So we said, "Well, we had to drink something." So we drank some liquid. Oh, okay. Anyway, I done mine, and then I sat. I remember going back to the changing room, and there's no one, no one in the changing room except Jim Paul, the kit man. And Jim, I said, "Jim, where's the champagne, Jim?" So he said, "Oh, there's a bottle over there." So I remember taking the bottle and going into the showers and there was a there was a bath still had water in. I remember sitting in the bath holding the bottle of champagne thinking to myself you know we've won this competition one of the biggest competitions in the world I'm sitting here drinking a bottle of champagne on my own with no one here and then of course Ken come in I says oh you managed it then so he said yeah so the both of us sat and then Jim Paul comes running in he said uh, you've got 10 minutes because the coach is going and if you're not on the coach, we, they're going to leave you. I went, well, the end. <laughs> so, of course, we quickly got, you know, showered, changed, run out, caught the coach and then all the wives were on the coach behind our coach um, and then we had an issue on the coach because some stupid person decided to hide the cup, namely me. Because it was, it wouldn't fit anywhere. There was nowhere that it, you couldn't put it on the top of the, you know, in the coach or anything. So I decided, that, which is the safest place, I put it in the toilet because it just stood nicely on the top of the toilet like that. So when Tony Barton was asking where the cup was, I, I don't know, I don't know. I said, and then someone said, you know, we lost the FA Cup in 1958. I went, well, might have lost the FA, uh, European Cup in 1982. But we didn't. I knew where it was. So we, um, someone went to the toilet and said, well, I found it. It's in here. I went, yeah, someone's always finding it, aren't they? Bit of a nosy question. But with all the riches that are going around now, Champions League, the most lucrative tournament for, for clubs and players' wages and TV and broadcast rights. I mean, I might be prying a little bit. So you might tell me, tell me to mind my business. But what was it worth as a footballer back then? Did you get a win bonus for it? What what would you what would your wages have been back then? You know what? I've got a sneaky feeling we got two and a half thousand pounds. I th- I think that's what we got. I think we got two and a half thousand pounds for winning it. Fair amount, wouldn't it, back then? Mm, Compared yeah. to you know. Yeah, but I don't know if you looked at, if you look back and and analyze it. I think. I just read an article about Alan Shearer saying it's 15 million would have been worth 220 million now. <laughs> um, you know, when he got transferred to Newcastle. Put it this way, I think, and I'm not 100% sure, but I, I think I remember Larry Lloyd telling me that they got 5,000 for winning theirs. And I think they got double when they won it again. It wasn't, I don't think it was a lot of money. A lot, maybe a lot of supporters might think at that time. In 82, it was a lot of money, but I'm not 100% sure. You don't, I'd have to look back and think. I just, I, I'm not 100%, but I've seen to think 2,500 reminds me of something. So I might be wrong. I might be wrong. Have you still got all your memorabilia? Have you still kept anything from then? I've got everything. I, don't, I haven't sold nothing. I didn't, I'm not, I've had requests. I've had lots of requests. Stephen, my son, has had lots of requests. Um, I just now it's um, I feel sorry for some of the players that have had to sell their memorabilia you know I feel sorry for them um, I had a picture of the medal um, and I took Stephen said to me can you take a picture of the medal that's the medal that's actually the medal when we went back for the 25th anniversary uh, in 2007 if you remember the club had them made. Yeah. So they had a medal made, and on the on the front was the European Cup, of course, 25th anniversary, and on the back was all the names of all the players that played in the European Cup. Um, 
so yes, I've I've kept my stuff, and uh, of course, uh, I think you remember that Stephen um, spoke to uh, Bayern Munich to get me shared back. Um, so I, I had Argentile's shirt, and he had mine. So we arranged. They said, "Oh, we'll post it to you." I said, "No, you won't." I said, "I'll fly to Bayern, and I'll come to." meet you there and I met Argent Tyler and I hadn't spoken to Argent Tyler since that day of offering them a beer and they said we're having lunch together so they said would you like a beer and I said yeah yeah and I said but Argent Tyler he won't have a beer so he went yes I will so I said you don't drink and he went no I just didn't want to drink on that day because we lost he said and it's he, he said of all the players he said, that loss sticks in the players' minds more than any other time. He said, we just, he said I'm not saying that we underestimated yet, but we, we didn't think there was a problem of beating us. He said, and all of a sudden we lost to you. He said, it was devastating to all of us. I said, well, give me my share back, which I did. Just finally, bringing it into the, the modern day, obviously you're going to be a very busy man over the next couple of months, you know, as we rightly rejoice in the 40th year anniversary of this this remarkable achievement. But listen, I suppose this is, I don't know whether it's a leading question or what, but we've obviously got a scouser at the helm at Villa Park again. He's obviously got big ideas about what he wants to achieve. I'm not saying, yes, Villa can go and win the European Cup and win the league again, but do you see the club in its current state as at least at least of having restored some of the optimism that's been lost in the last 10 years? Yeah, I would say so, because you know it's, it's always the same sort of thing with regards to um, when, he, when he took over and the hype with regards to, oh, he's using it as a stepping stone to go to Liverpool. I don't look at it that way sort of thing. I think that um, he's been given an opportunity in the Premier League to manage a team and it's not just, you know, no disrespect to anyone else. It, it's a it's a big club. Aston Villa's a big club so he's taken on a, a big task um, and he seems to have the backroom staff um, with him that's going to help him along the way. So, you know, why not? But in the position, if you're going in as a manager, you're not, you're not going to be thinking about, well, we're just going to survive. If you're thinking that, then you shouldn't go and manage Aston Villa Football Club. And I think, knowing Steve Jeddah, he, he'll be thinking to himself, we want to win things um, and build on it. And he knows what's happened in the past. Uh, and he'll be reminded of it, certainly this year, with regards to coming to the end of the year. Um, so I'm sure, you know, like I said, I had ambitions when I joined Aston Villa about winning things, I'm sure that he joined, joined Aston Villa and thought exactly the same as that, you know, we, we want to win things. And he's won things in the past with regards to in his managerial career at the Rangers, but also in his football career. So, you know, I think that he would have in his mind that he wants to try and, you know, achieve things and win things. Um, and I think that's that's a wonderful thing. That's a, it's, it's wonderful and it's in his nature. So hopefully, um, you know, we'll see it over the, you know, the coming coming weeks, how that progression is being made. And I think that, um, you know, they've, they've showed signs whenever I've watched them this season and I've tried to watch them as much as what I possibly can. Uh, they've shown me in, in, in spells where they've dominated games and sometimes you don't get the results when you dominate games, but they seem to be going in the right direction. They seem to have signed... Decent players, good players. Why not? Why not? You know, if you if you don't dream about doing things like that, I don't think you should be managing any football club. I should imagine your calendar is going to be absolutely jam packed when you when you return to to Birmingham and England in the next couple of weeks. But I know you've got got something that you wanted to to plug. It's a golf day at Nalcote Hall. Is that right, Peter? Yes. Yeah. Well, we've um, we're trying to sort of. Um, put a golf, we talk like fun, is having a bit of a fun day. And um, I, I've done it before with regards to Nail Coat Hall. And um, they've got a little nine or golf course. I used to always play in the par three championship, won it a few times, by the way. It's just sort of a, a exercise that Stephen's putting together to try and just, um, again, with supporters involved, to try and get them to mix with the players and try and get as many of the players to, together 
and in, enjoy because, you know, it's 40 years. And the last time we got together with regards to this was 2007 for 25 years. So, and the phenomenal thing really is that all the players are, are still here, still together. Um, where there's a lot of clubs that I've looked at and they've lost players over the years um, through various circumstances. So I think that we should sort of enhance what we've got and enjoy it. And I think that when when we get back together, when the players get back together, it's, you know, it's like, I wouldn't say it's like the old days, but it's like the new days. I think that uh, the reminiscent and the, the banter that we had when we were playing is prevalent again when we meet up together so the golf day to me is going to be uh wonderful for supporters to join in with it and uh, as i say what i've remembered in the past to try and you know even just throwing sweatbands into the crowd you know to have a golf day and to and to play golf with whether it be myself or whether it be other players but just to have that connection and because it's you know it's a nail coat um, and it's quite small. You, you sort of bump into each other. It's not as if you're on the golf course miles away from one another. You're quite close to one another. So it, it, I'm looking forward to it. It should be a fun day. It's on the 19th of May. Um, so, yeah, it's going to be um, it's going to be a good day. And we're, we're sort of going... I mean, if you look on Stephen Wyth's um, website, on his Facebook, you'll see all the, de- the dates and the flyers that are going out Um so yeah, get involved if you can get involved. That's fine. We'll give that give that a decent plug in the comments as well when we put this out as a podcast and as as a YouTube video. All that remains to be said is just thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks for your time. Thanks for the memories. Thanks for taking us back on a on a trip down memory lane. I, I know that you're um you're probably gonna have your game head on. I know you, got, you know you said you had your game head on for when you play matches, but I think you've probably got your game head on for for reminiscing and telling anecdotes over the next couple of months, haven't you? So thank, thanks very much for sharing them with me with me, and with the, the viewers of the Clarence Blue podcast. It's always a pleasure. It's, uh, people say to me, you know, wherever I go, and they say, you must be bored talking about it. You know, talking about football, I never get bored about talking. I never get bored about talking because I've always had the gift of the gap. I don't know whether it's because it's coming from where I am, but it's always a pleasure really to reminisce. And as I say, when I, when I meet supporters whether wherever it is over the world they think they're intruding but they're not really you know i think that it's if even if you're having a quiet meal you know it's just a question of saying look i'll finish my meal and then i'll come and chat and i've done that on many occasions and uh i think that's the important thing really is that um we seem to be in a position where we want to communicate with supporters again and, and make them feel part of it. No, that's brilliant. Well, I'll let, on, let you get on with the rest of the, your day. Keep you, keep you working on that handicap. And uh, yeah, we'll see you see you back in Birmingham very soon. Thank you for listening to Claret and Blue and Aston Villa podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, then please do let us know. We love hearing your feedback. We'll be back soon with another episode. But until then, up the villa. Up the villa.